The solution, really, the obvious solution, is get rid of the hazard. Don't try to control it. Don't try to contain it. Eliminate it. And that's where molten salts come in. And it's awfully simple chemistry. Iodine is halogen, like chlorine. It's volatile. Sodium iodide is in table salt. It's not volatile. It's secure. It's stable. Same is true for cesium. Cesium in the elemental form is volatile. In the form of a salt, chloride or a fluoride, it's not volatile. So just by using salt as the fuel, molten salt as the fuel, you lock away these really dangerous isotopes in forms where they're still there, but they are not going to be released into the air. And at a stroke, a large part of your problems go away. There are many other advantages to molten salt fuel. I'm not going to go into them. There are many more. The big one is the intrinsic safety. Okay, so given that molten salt reactors, reactors fueled with molten salt fuel, should be a lot safer and therefore should be a lot cheaper. But there's always a but. This little diagram is taken from the, uh, the outline design of the Generation 4 uh, International Forum prototype molten salt reactor. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Just say that each one of those nice tidy boxes represents a piece of very complex engineering that's not so far been done on an industrial scale. And that engineering has to be done in a way that never requires to be approached by a human being. The radioactivity of the salt we're talking about here is so high, no human being could ever get near it. Every bit of maintenance, every plugging of a leak, God help us, has to be done by remote control. Can it be done? Yes, of course it can be done. Is that going to be cheaper than a light water reactor than Hinkley C? I would require some convincing. But all of that complexity comes from the fact that you are pumping this liquid fuel around a chemical engineering system. And right back in 1949, when the molten salt uh, reactor was first conceived, a decision was made. In 1949, the idea for molten salt reactors was to take the molten salts, put them into tubes just like in a conventional reactor with uranium oxide, pass coolant out to the outside, and it would be very simple. In 1950, they gave up on that idea and instead built this complex chemical engineering circuit. Why? But that decision to abandon the simple concept has driven the design of every single molten salt reactor since. Why did they do it? Well, you know, these were quite clever people. They weren't stupid. What they calculated was that molten salts got very, very poor thermal conductivity. Really poor. About 10 times worse than uranium oxide, which is itself not great. And they calculated, very, very simple physics, that in order to get the heat out from that molten salt by conduction, the tubes containing it would have to be no more than two millimetres in diameter. And that simply was not going to work. Critically, though, they consciously and deliberately ignored the contribution of convection to heat flow in liquids, which is a bizarre thing to do. Every high school student knows that convection is far more important than conduction in transporting heat and liquids. They ignored it. They ignored it for a very good reason. They were designing, it seemed like a good idea at the time, a nuclear reactor-powered bomber who's going on an aeroplane. Aeroplanes do interesting things like going to dives. The force of gravity apparently disappears. Convection then stops. Convection is a gravity-driven phenomena. And so they couldn't rely on convection. Their decision to ignore convection was absolutely the right decision to make. <coughs> Unfortunately, they didn't revisit that decision when they gave up on nuclear power bombers decided to build power stations on the ground. But projects get momentum. I'm sure you've all got experience of that. So what we did is we did that. We went back and re-examined that decision. And in the context of ground-based reactor, the decision was wrong. This graph shows data produced by computational fluid dynamics calculations showing how much heat you can get out of molten salts in a simple tube. The blue PWR power density 
That's the power density of a conventional pressurized water reactor. So you can get better power densities with molten salt fuel courtesy of convective behavior. So basically, the original idea of just putting the molten salts in tubes works. At that point, I can almost stop the presentation because that's actually the key to it. Um, but let me move on. Taking that simple concept that you can produce fuel tubes just like the fuel rods in conventional reactors is the key. Turning that into reactor design is at one level complicated, at one level simple. When I stood up two years ago at a system meeting to this, this was the design. And what I want to do is to really focus on a couple of, of updates for that. Usually, when you start with a really simple conceptual design on the back of an envelope, and then engage with engineering reality, it gets more complicated and more difficult. Again, I'm sure you've all got experience of that. As a high, this project has been extraordinary. It's gone the other direction. As we've gone into more detail, it's actually got simpler. I want to take you through two of those simplifications now. First one is these tubes which you're putting the molten salt into. The molten salt's going to get very hot. 1,000 degrees Celsius plus. And so we assumed we'd have to use uh, tubes to contain it, made of something like molybdenum or tungsten or something very, very refractory. That was possible. The technology is there to do it. Um, it turned out that was actually not necessary because when you look at the detailed analysis of the computational fluid dynamics, that hot fuel does not mean you have hot tubes. This shows a function of power density, the temperature of the, the peak temperature of the molten salt, which can go up to 1400, 1500 degrees Celsius, but the tube itself never goes significantly above the temperature of the coolant. All the barrier to heat transport is actually from the salt to the tube. Once it's in the tube, it goes out very quickly. Result is, you don't need refractive materials. These temperatures are entirely consistent with standard steels. And that's important, because in the nuclear sector, getting approval for a new material, that's new for nuclear, is an enormously challenging job. This means that existing nuclear certified steels can be used. 